Good morning again. It's, all, it's always good to see you folks. Um, I've said it before, and it's not because it seems like it should be so, though it is. But uh, Sunday's my favorite day of the week. <laughs> Even if it wasn't a pastor, it's just, just uh, part of being in community with one another. Just going to church, it's part of my life that it's been that way for years. And I just could not imagine not being able to do this. Uh, I just praise God for the privilege and the responsibility to come together like this and uh, be blessed by all of you who are here as well. Um, we're going to still, we're still in uh, chapter 9 of, of, the, of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we're actually, it's up, if you're using a Pew Bible, it's going to be a page 1006. Um, 1006, if you're using the Pew Bible. It is very tempting to uh, try and finish this chapter because, but there's about, there's like three to four very specific, I would say, teaching blocks that you can use here that you can really learn a lot from. So we're not going to go too far. We're just going to read about four verses, but we're going to look at some parallel issues to discuss a theme and talk about really our, our sovereign God and how he is sovereign even in some of the most profound difficulties that, that one might face in life and that he has purpose and we're not going to go to Romans 8 but you guys know that it is there I believe it's 8 28 that says that, that God causes all things to work together uh, for the good to those who love him and are called according to his people so he causes all things to work together for the good that doesn't mean all things are good but all things he will cause to work together for the good of his people. Okay? Those who love him and are called according to his people are his people. Right? Uh, according to his purpose are his people. Um, so he causes all things to work together for you and I, believer, brother and sister in Christ. And I would say for those who haven't come to be brothers and sisters in Christ yet, but will in the future. I mean, God has us all in mind even through some of the greatest difficulties in your life personally, uh, as things might touch you and you alone, or to your family uh, personally, uh, or to the greater community of, of where you live, uh, whether it's your, your, your uh, city, your state, uh, or your country. Um, God is sovereign in all things. And certainly, obviously, obviously, in spite of all the difficulties that we see, from the riots to the coronavirus to to just, uh, uh, and, and we grow weary, I think, weary of these things because uh, somebody recently told me they just get so tired of all of this corona, this mask, no mask, this, that, the other thing, do this, do that. I just, and I said, well, well I am too. <laughs> you know, we are too. It's, you just, it does, you get weary. You're just like, you get tired of hearing. I get tired of every time, whether I'm on social media, whether it's Facebook or, or YouTube or anything, when I pull up, and they've got to have a little ad next to it or a banner click and here, coronavirus, get the latest, coronavirus, get the latest, coronavirus. I'm like, stop for a minute, okay? Give me five minutes. If I want to go see what the latest death toll is, really bad, let me go look it up. I'll Google it, okay? You don't have to throw it in my face every moment. You do get weary. But you remember, theologically, we have a God who's sovereign. And he's going to cause all things to work together for the good for our good. And we don't see how that happens. And, and it may, in the interim, it may hurt us personally. It may cause us pain emotionally, maybe physically, but God is going to bring a good out of it. Not simply a good for us, but that is their part of it, but also a good that will bring glory to himself. Amen? Amen? And so that's what I want to look at. When I look at these verses here, uh, that's really the theme. I want to look at God's sovereignty and bringing good out of things that are difficult and bad uh, in spite of uh, circumstances. But well, let's start in chapter 9, verse 30. From there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he, this Jesus, did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. 
but they did not understand the statement and they were afraid to ask him. Now, he said a statement like this before, right? Now, you notice they didn't understand the statement here. They didn't understand it before. They don't understand it now. They don't quite get it. Because remember, they're still looking for the Messiah who's going to, you know, who's going to go in. And this will happen very next week because the disciples are going to wonder about what their position is going to be in the coming kingdom. They still have an expectation that he's ultimately going to establish his throne right there in Jerusalem, throw off the yoke of Rome, um, deal with all the wicked, um, and uh, bless all the righteous, and reign right there. I mean, they still expect that of the Messiah. Because they believe he's the Messiah, but they don't realize they don't quite get the suffering part of it, which is in the Old Testament, the prophecies in the Old Testament, uh, the Messiah would suffer and die. They are there, but they're missing that. At this point, that's not what they're thinking. And nationally, that's, that's, that's I would say, the bulk of Judaism is thinking about in terms of the Messiah. So they don't understand it. And, says, and, they, and they said they didn't ask him. They were afraid to ask him anything about it. And, and you might imagine, you might remember, uh, and know why they didn't want to ask him anything is because of the last time Jesus said something like this, what happened? Peter, and I think his heart was in the right place, but his, his lack of understanding, he was putting his foot in his mouth, and he says, ah, no, no, may it never be. Nobody's going to kill you, Lord. And, and Jesus rebuked him, remember? He said, get thee behind me, Satan, right? Because this is God's plan. This is how it has to work out. And who are you to stand up and say it can't happen or shouldn't happen or that somehow you're going to stop it from happening? Even if you got the right motives, right, and good intentions, well, he was very wrong. And we've all heard the old cliche, you know, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Peter's wrong and got rebuked in front of all of his buddies and everything. <laughs> he got told to put down hard. And then when the Jesus says this, there's no doubt they're probably like, what? Like, I ain't saying nothing to him. Remember what happened last time? Peter opened his mouth. Right? I asked him about No, I ain't asking him nothing. I went up. That's probably why they were afraid, because they, 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 Peter was rebuked at that, that time. But their misunderstanding is there. He's telling them very cleanly that he's going to be delivered into the hands of men, be killed, and be raised in three days, right? Now, this word delivered, it says the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. You might have a translation out there. One of you might have a translation that says that it betrayed. He'll be betrayed. And, of course, we know he's going to be betrayed. We know that Judas is going to be uh, the betrayer. Uh, but it, it's not betrayed. It is delivered. And all the early uh, church fathers who wrote about this passage and earliest sermons we find, they clearly look at this idea of being delivered is that God delivers him into the hands of men that the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. This is God delivering. God the Father, if you will. If you want to be particular, God the Father delivers him into the hands of men. And I think this is exactly how you ought to interpret it. And we're going to, like I said, look at some other verses in light of that as well. Because remember, when he stands before Pilate, Pilate says, don't you know, I have the power to free you. And Jesus said, you'd have no power over me unless it's given you from above. And that's true from Judas betraying him. Couldn't have happened if the power wasn't given from above. Delivered in the hands of men. Delivered in the hands of his betrayer, Judas. Delivered into the hands of those soldiers who arrested him. Delivered into the hands of the, of the, of the, uh, the wicked Pharisees. And of course, the, the wicked, uh, I would say, the, um, King Herod and Pontius Pilate and ultimately delivered into the hands of the people who will say, free Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And of course the Romans who would beat him, scourge him, and uh, spit on him, whip him, and then nail him to a cross. Delivered into the hands by God. Because Jesus said that no one would have any power over me unless it's given to them of the Father. Remember, there's times where they tried to lay hands on Jesus and kill him before. But he would just disappear from their presence, and they couldn't get a hold of him. He just always managed to slip away or disappear. Why? Because it wasn't his time, and it wasn't the method. It had to happen exactly at the right time, in exactly the right manner, as predicted, I should say foretold, by God through the prophets in the Old Testament. So, of course, this is something that is going to happen. And, of course, when he says that, that you wouldn't have any power over me, 
Jesus himself said, no one takes my life from me. This is in John 10. No one takes my life from me. And he says, he lays it down. And he says, this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life. And if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. No one takes it from me. He just gives it voluntarily. And so that no human being, no scheme of the devil, could do a thing to Jesus if it wasn't something that God put in their power to do. And to underscore this, I'm going to flip over to, to the book of Acts. And uh, it's chapter 4, page 1092. Just turn right several pages. If you're using a few Bible, 1092. Acts chapter 4. I want you to see this understanding of Jesus' crucifixion. Peter and John, remember Peter, John, and James, they had been there for the transfiguration. Uh, they were unique and they experienced more than than uh, the other disciples. Well, at this point, Peter and, and uh, John had been, uh, they, had, they had healed a lame man, and they'd been proclaiming Jesus and the, and, 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 and the gospel and uh, the power of the resurrection in Jesus' name and, and uh, proclaiming the gospel, and then they get arrested for it. And they're arrested, and, the, and the, the, the Pharisees and so forth, they chide them, and they essentially tell them, listen, you need to stop preaching in Jesus' name, right? You need to shut up about this and we'll let you go. And Peter said, you know, well, you, you judge for yourself. Is it better to obey men or God? And they point out that we can't stop preaching. The picture Jesus is the only name given under heaven by which we must be saved, right? We're not going to shut up. Can't do it. They said, well, well, yeah, you better shut up. And if you don't, you're in trouble now. And then they released them. <laughs> they went back to the companions, reported what had happened. The people lifted up their voices and they say this, they're speaking to God, praying to God, if you will. And this is what they say. They're speaking to God in verse 28 of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 28. Actually, let's start at verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So everything from Judas, who is foretold, to Jesus' uh, arrest, his sham trial, his crucifixion, all of these things were foretold. All of these things, you have a lot of players. A lot of people think that they're just doing what they want to do, and in one sense they are. They're following their own sinful natures. The thing is, it's just like open up the floodgates. If you don't open the floodgates, the water doesn't flow. You open it up, the water flows. In a very real sense, some of the things and the devices of man, um, God withholds, and if he lets the floodgates open, it's because he's got his purpose in doing so. Are these people exercising their will? Yes, they are, but then ultimately in doing that, they are serving God's will. In life, because they're just doing simply what, what it says. What his hand and his purpose predestined to occur. That's from Judas, that's from the soldiers, that's from the Romans uh, soldiers, that's from uh, Judas, that's from Herod, to, to put him on that cross and the people cry and crucify him, and then mocking him from down below. All of that, God's hand and purpose predestined to occur. In other words, it could not not happen. It had to happen. So again, God's sovereignty. If you want to talk about God's sovereignty and causing all things to work together for the good, this is the greatest evil in all of creation, in all of human history, ever visited upon a person. I would say the person of Jesus Christ. The trial, if you know anything about the, the, the Old Testament law, the trial, many steps in the trial was done illegally outside of the law, and yet they feigned that they were upholding the integrity of the law and God's will. But they broke a lot of laws in how this trial was conducted, when it was conducted, and, and witness issues, and a lot of different things. It was a sham trial. And of course, you know, not just Herod, but uh, Pilate. Pilate should have released him if he was going to be lawful about it, but he decided to appease the crowd instead for political expediency. But what's incredible about all this is God planned it all. 
But this evil is beyond what you can imagine because this evil leads to Jesus being beaten, spit upon. Uh, he's going to all the gruesome details, but ultimately murdered. If our lives are difficult, <laughs> whatever they might be, and it's not to say we don't hurt or have pains or fears. It doesn't mean those things aren't real. But if we can look at these things and what happened to Jesus, it had to happen. Some of the greatest suffering and torture you can imagine. And then the murder of Christ. But what is the result? It is the salvation of untold hundreds of millions of human beings in the last 2,000 years through this present day. That would not have been possible, that way would have not have been open to us if it had not happened. But God, in his wisdom and in his love, decided he wanted to reconcile us to himself. And this is the means by which he's done so. Bringing, we want to talk about good out of bad. Causing all things, even their wicked schemes, to work together for the good that ultimately brings the glory for our good and uh, the glory to God himself. And that's a profound way to think about these things. And your God is sovereign over everything in your life. Everything. Everything. And I've shared this with you before. Not all of you have heard me share because you, know, you weren't here when I've shared it before. When, we, when my, the disc broke in my neck and that miserable almost three months of pain, those of you who remember when I came to church, I would I kept my hand like this, I was because I was constantly pulling my arm this way because of all the pain, the pain in my neck, pain in my elbow, shoulder, pain in my hand. Pain was so bad I'd use a tens unit. Some of you know what that is. I put it up on, on my back for about an hour. I put it on my shoulder for about an hour, my elbow for about an hour, my hand for about an hour, every night before I could actually get some sleep because the pain was so bad. And I sleep for about four hours or so, and I wake up screaming. It was murderous pain, horrific pain. And I've shared this with some of you because our daughters, because you know, you've seen, we've all seen too many movies, right? And too many, she she was afraid I was going to kill myself because of the pain I was in. And what do I do? I've been screaming, tinge unit, <laughs> get that going, <laughs> throw a bunch of pills on my throat. 30 minutes later, an hour, it's tolerable enough I could function. But they're screaming and hollering. I've never felt such pain. But I know my God is sovereign. I know he didn't leave me or forsake me. I know that he was causing all things to work together, even that for the good. Even if I don't fully understand it. And yes, I prayed to him for healing, yes. And then when I, and there are times when I would get upset that he was letting me experience this. But when I did, you know what I had to do? As hard as this may seem, it's what any one of us would have to do. Is go back to the Lord in prayer. If, if, if I had to do it every day or every other day, I found myself upset. Why is God letting this happen? And just go... He works all things together and just praise him anyway and say, God, forgive me for doubting you. I know you've got purpose in this. You're still a great God. You're still an awesome God. In spite of the pain, I would say that and pray that to him. And it's not hyperbole. The pain was ugly. And when I come to church, I was always holding my arm like this. Because when I pulled it this way, it gave enough relief for that. I could tolerate it. You can still find pictures from about seven years ago where I've got my hand like this. And that's the way that was. And the pain was that horrific. And it took months before I finally get an MRI and yada yada. It was finally the surgery. And it's not fixed everything because I still have issues with my hands. And pain, tingling, and numbness, and weirdness. It's weird. But praise God, I can still play my bass. And that's fun. But the suffering of Christ. 
You see, and the, that's the funny thing, is surgery, right? Think about surgery. People say, well, is God ever justified in allowing horrible pain and so forth to come? Well, yeah, if he's got a good purpose on the other side of it, sure. And one analogy is you think about surgery. You know, I had this, the, uh, the, the cancerous polyp they found uh, in my colon, and they had to cut out some of my colon. Uh, they, they, first they, they did the, the liposcopic thing, wasn't working out, so they stabbed me about five times with that, and then they had a leg where they worked, so they cut me open. It's just like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, somebody taking a, a sword and jammed it in my stomach, just about a foot long. The recovery from that was horrifically painful, too. It was bad, especially the first few days. But listen, if I was walking down the street and somebody walked up and stabbed me in the gut and ripped up with a, a foot long gash, uh, same thing the doctors did. But somebody on the street has a malevolent purpose, nothing good they're going to bring about. But it is okay, and I think sovereignly okay, for a doctor to cause pain, trying to mitigate it the best. It puts you out, of course. Praise God for modern anesthesia. And of course, there's medications that give you every two hours when you first wake up for a while. So praise God for that. But it's still pain, and I tell you what, the first steps I had to make in the first few weeks of, oh boy, and just getting in the car, <coughs> every bump horrible. <laughs> These kinds of things. Post operative pain. It's justified, but brings about a greater good of what? Saving my life. The doctor cut me open with the benevolent purpose, bringing about the greater good of removing the cancer and saving my life. And the post operative pain and everything that was justified, praise God, because it brought about a greater good. Now, the horrible pains that Jesus felt here and went through. The most excruciating part was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that was also, we would never have to be crying out from hell that same phrase. Because forsaking isn't forgotten. If a person forsakes you, they're well aware of your circumstances and choose not to intervene. That's what hell is. You're forsaken by God. Jesus wasn't in hell, but the separation relationally with the Father, he felt in a way that we never have to. Now, I want to turn back down to a famous story in Genesis 45. Similarly, to underscore all this and wrap it up. So we're going to go back to Genesis 45 and 50. This is page 50 and 56. In your pew Bible, 50 and 56, Genesis. we will be in chapter 45. Just a few verses in each and 50, and we'll close. It's the story of Joseph, and then we're going to look at a couple key points that he brings up. But you know about Joseph, right? <laughs> His dad was Israel. And Israel, before it was the name of the nation, uh, was Jacob's name. Jacob's name is Israel, right? He has all of his sons, and those sons will be the head of all the tribes that will make up ultimately the nation of Israel, right? So Joseph and all of his brothers, they're all hanging out, and, and, uh, and well, he has a couple dreams. And where do these dreams come from? They come from God. <laughs> well, he has one dream, it's that, uh, that they're out gathering, bringing in the sheaves, like the old song, bringing in the sheaves, it's a, a bundle of, uh, of uh, wheat, what have you, right? And uh, they're out gathering sheaves, he and his brothers, and he had had a dream that his, that he, well, that was what his dream was, was that they were gathering sheaves, and, and he set up his bundle of uh, a sheaf, if you will, and all of their sheaves bowed to his. And he told them about that. You know, are you, you're going to rule over us? We hate you. <laughs> they hated him. They hated him for that, and, and also that, that he was favored by Papa. But Papa loved him, right? That extravagant coat, you know, some translations say coat of many colors. Um, you know what it literally means in the Hebrew? It means a coat of hands and feet. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means it is extravagant because it means it had full sleeves all the way down to the hands, the palms, and full all the way down to his feet. 
because when you were putting together and, and uh, weaving, things took a long, 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 long time. You're more likely to get a short sleeve tunic type thing, right? That means it was extravagant. Right? Yes, he was treated and favored well. And the favoritism, we could have a nice little dysfunctional discussion about how favoritism among the family and the siblings is wrong, <laughs> but he was favored, and his brothers hated him for it. And then he has his dream. And what's funny is when he tells them about the dream, you know, none of them go, well, I want what God's trying to say. <laughs> Not at all. No, no concern. He has another dream where the sun, the moon, and 11 stars all bow down to him. And of course, that is not just his brothers, but it's his mother and father. His dad didn't even like that dream. He says, I'm going to bow down to you, and he rebukes him. And it just says, and his father kept this in mind. But the brothers, again, they hated him for it. So what did they do, right? Well, we'll try and go through this real quick. So they disguise this, well, they're going to kill him. But one of the brothers talks him out of this, and what they end up doing is they end up uh, selling him into slavery, right? They sell him into slavery, they fake his death, they, they take back bloody clothes and tell dad he's dead. And they sell him into slavery. He gets, and of course, the, the people, the slavers that bought him, they take him down, they sell him in Egypt. He sold to actually a rich man down there named Potiphar. And so this guy was some kind of an aristocrat in Egypt, and he was actually doing pretty well. He was, becomes the head of the servants in Potiphar's house. But then, of course, but he's still a slave. Sold into slavery. His brothers did a horrible, evil thing. Faking his death, fooling the father, saying he's dead. Father's freaking out, thinks he's dead. But he's down there, he's a slave. But oh, you know what? Hey, but even in this, well, God's blessed me. It's because I, you know, he's risen to the place where he's running the household and taking care of things and, and the head of the servants. But then the wife says, uh, yeah, hey, yeah, buddy, how about you and me get together? And she comes on to him, takes a hold of him, and he had probably not that long coat, something thin on, because he takes off and, and runs, and she has a hold of his clothes as he runs off. Rips out of him. Because he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to cheat. He wasn't going to lie with his master's wife. He runs off naked, but of course he looks pretty, pretty guilty, right? Can you imagine if you had had those dreams and you're, you're a believer in Yahweh, you worship the one true God and you love God and you have these dreams, you're trying to understand, what does God have in store for me? And then your brothers do this to you. And you're also, you're sold into slavery, you're thrown in a pit. God, what's happening? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? Then they drag him out only to find out, well, you're going into shackles, you're, you're, you're sold into slavers. God, what are you doing? And then he, he gets to this place where, of course, he's in this home, and he's thinking, well, I'm a slave. And you might begin to think, well, okay, but God's blessed me, at least in, in my slavery. Even in these circumstances, God has still blessed me because, look, he's allowed me to rise up to, I'm really trusted by my master and everything. And all of a sudden, this happens, <laughs> right? Now he's accused of sexual assault or attempt of rape, which he's innocent of as a completely false allegation. The Potiphar believes his wife throws him in prison. He was thinking, well, God, what? Here we go again, Lord. Why, Lord? What's going on? And he might have had those times where he thought that. But I would think with his character, because he's human, but I think with his character, he would have come back around and said, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to praise you anyway. I don't understand all this, and that's what we need to be like, is we don't understand all this. But God, you're going to work something good out of all this. Now, he's in prison for years. There's a couple guys thrown in there. It's the, the, the baker and the, the, uh, the cupbearer from the Pharaoh. And, uh, you know, Pharaoh's been having this dream. And then he, well, they, they let him know what it is. He interprets it. He goes back and, and uh, um, well, I think it's the baker gets killed. And the cupbearer is freed. And he's like, hey, put in a good word for the with the Pharaoh for me. And the guy takes off, and I'm sure Joseph's like, this is great. This is what God's going to use to get me out of here. And it is, but not in the short term. <laughs> because what, what happens is, is the guy forgets about him. He doesn't say, Pharaoh, hey, yeah, it's this guy Joseph in there. He's the one who interpreted the dream. But later, the Pharaoh has a different dream, 
and he's troubled by it, and the guy says, hey, but it's years later again. But, you know, Joseph was still blessed, right? In spite of the circumstances, he became like the head of uh, the, the prison inmates, uh, one of the most trusted trustees, if you will, and uh, he had a little bit of a prominent position there. He's still a prisoner. But finally, he gets called because I think, I said, forgive me for not looking it up first. I think it was the, the cupbearer uh, who said that, uh, it was that of the baker, but I think it was the cupbearer, who had told the Pharaoh, hey, he interpreted that dream, so Pharaoh calls for him. He interprets the Pharaoh's dream, and, and we know this is about the coming famine, right? And he interprets the dream. God gives him the interpretation. It's very clear the scripture tells us that God gives him Joseph the interpretation, that there's going to be seven years of, of uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine. And so he's the one who comes up with a plan of saving and putting stuff away and stockpiling and so for seven years while everything's good. And then when the famine came, they were, they were doing great. Not only was Egypt doing great, but they were able to save regions around them because they're the only ones who survived and had grain that people could come and buy. Even his own family back in Canaan, okay, would be able to come there. So he ultimately gets up there, moves into ultimately the position of second most powerful in Egypt. And now you can say, after years and years of all these horrible things that happened, and you look at this and like, wow, God has finally blessed him. Why did he have to go through all those difficulties to be in that position? Why did God do it that way? We don't know. God could have just blessed him back in Canaan. He could have worked things out completely different. No plague, no famine. I mean, sorry, no, no famine and so forth. But whatever purpose in all of those things, God had purpose in all of those things. And how he deals with the Egyptians and everything else, and how he deals with the other nations, the other Canaanite people groups, as well as God's chosen people, who will come to be known as the Israelites, right? So this is, we're going to look at Joseph. So his family, he's second power in Egypt. His family has come down to, to get grain in Egypt, his brothers in particular. They come a couple times, but where I'm picking this up at is where he reveals himself to his brothers. He finally says, I am your brother. This is chapter 45. I think I've already given you page 50 in Genesis in the pre-Bible. Chapter 45, verse 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And wouldn't you be? We sold you into slavery. Oh my gosh, he's a powerful man and he's going to kill us all. <laughs> they didn't worry about that. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me here before you to preserve life. This is beautiful. First of all, they're like, who? <laughs> He could have put them to death. He said, surely, he's going to take vengeance on us. And he said, but he says, don't be grieved. Don't be angry with yourselves. Because you sold me here. Because that's what he did. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He's saying, even in what you did, God sent me here before you. Down here to ultimately put me in this position. And he's going to explain why. For the famine, verse 6, has been in the land these two years. Remember, it's going to be seven years of famine. They're two years into this famine. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. This is a purpose. And why God worked it out this way, I don't know. And why God works out a number of things in our lives certain ways when we think we could have done it differently, or he could have done it much easier, <laughs> or whatnot. But God has purpose in everything in our lives. And their evil, their jealousies, and their selling them into slavery, lying to their father, faking his death. God was sovereign. He recognized that God sent me here before you. And that's the reason to preserve. It says a remnant, but it's beyond this. And he knew this as well. He preserved a lot of surrounding people groups by being able to come to Egypt. If he hadn't been there, then you wouldn't have had the preparation in which other, other nations could come into Egypt and get food and survive. 
they all become greatly indebted to Egypt. <laughs> they all do, yes. It enriches Egypt and its, its power structure and its government immensely. But also, and it, so it helps them out. But who is it supposed to primarily help out? The chosen people of God in Canaan. To bring them and to preserve them. They will ultimately, the whole family will get moved down. They'll be there and they will prosper and they will grow to be to number close to a couple million. And of course then it says that Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph and he does enslave them. And we can talk about God's sovereignty and all that as well. That's a whole, that's getting further ahead of the story than where we want to go today. But so he's down there and he says, that God sent me here, right? And he says it now, therefore, verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And yes, second power under Pharaoh himself. But he, he handled all these things for the Pharaoh. But he said that it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. Has he lost his cotton pig in mind? Did they not send him there? Did they, did they not sell him into slavery? To some slave traders who were in caravan on their way to Egypt? Yeah. But this is what's beautiful. Looking at the sovereign hand of God in his life. As horrible as that was. Could you know, he's a young, young, a young man. And his brothers did this wicked thing to him and threw him in his cistern. Can you imagine the fear he felt? And the crying he must have done. And uh, here he is in this point, the wisdom and the maturity of this man of God. So it wasn't you, I mean, it's God. I mean, God was sovereign. And you can see the purpose, the good. He is work, causing all things to work out for the good. This is a picture, ultimately, of what Christ did. He was betrayed, Right? And he was ultimately put to death for us. And I just want to look at one more little statement from, from Joseph here in chapter 50. Just flip over to 50. 16 through 21. Saying the same thing, but it's worded a little differently. I like, I like the phraseology here. Chapter 50, verse 16. Now, now uh, Joseph's father has died. They're going to take him and bury him. And afterwards, the brothers are afraid. Uh-oh. Israel's dead, now he's really going to get us. Now that dad, he was okay while dad was alive, but now that dad's dead, he's going to take vengeance on us. But of course they're wrong. Verse 16, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, this is their insurance policy, hey, dad said before he died, that you're supposed to be nice to us and forgive us. That's basically what they say, but let's read it. Uh, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brother's and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph went when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him, and behold, said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So it says, what you meant for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about this present result to preserve many people. So we, we talked about that. But this phraseology, of course, he says, wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And now he says, it, which does acknowledge the human side of it. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. How that dichotomy exists, we cannot fully understand, but only a sovereign God can make it work out that way. It's the same thing with all the wicked people, Judas, the soldiers, Pontius, uh, Herod, the, the crowds who cried for Jesus to be crucified. All that was to fulfill God's purpose and what he had ordained to happen. To bring about a much greater good. And if this is how God operates in Joseph's life, how he operates in the, the, uh, the plan of redemption through Jesus Christ, 
in our sufferings, in our difficulties, he operates exactly the same way. All the difficulties that are going to come upon us, have come upon us, or will come upon us, God is sovereign, and he has guaranteed us that he's going to bring and work out a good that we may or may not see in this lifetime, but whether we see it or not, we trust that that is the reality of our God as he has revealed himself in scriptures to us. And as he's revealed himself in, in saving us, filling us with his spirit, making us new creatures in Christ. So have that confidence in light of COVID, in light of uh, our government wickedness that's going on, and just all the ugliness in our country, the riots, everything. When I say that I believe we're nearing those times where the tribulation period is, is coming in the, in the near future, this is all still a reality, every bit of this. Because when the world looks like it's all out of control and it looks like where in the world is God and all this, he's there, he's here, he's in the midst of it, he loves us, he cares for us, he won't forsake us, he will deliver us up or help us bear through all the difficulties until we find that ultimate rest in his presence in heaven. And so we can trust him and find a way to get through and strength to carry on. It doesn't mean hurts don't hurt, but it means we can trust God and praise him in spite of him and sometimes in spite of our own propensity to, to want to be angry or, or mad at God or doubtful of his promises. We can rein ourselves back in in light of the truth that we've come to know that our God loves us and in his wisdom is causing all things, even the bad things in our lives, he's going to cause them to work together for the good to those who love him and call him accordingly. And that is even if, whether it's natural disasters, disease, or human malevolence visited upon you. God will call all of those things, cause all of those things to work together for the good for our good ultimately and to his glory and if you can look at your Lord and his sufferings you'd say amen God is going to bring some beautiful thing out of my difficulties my hearts and my pain because he loves me and he has said this is what he is doing in and through my life I don't need to fear I don't need to doubt because we have an awesome God. Amen. And I pray that that encourages you, that word encourages you this morning. And, and with that, we're going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you in prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love and your grace again. And I just pray, Father God, that you help us to be just so encouraged by the beauty of your sovereign hand in and through all difficult things. Those things that, that afflict just us as individuals personally or our families or our communities or our co country or the world at large, Father God, that you are sovereign in all those things. You are going to cause all things to work together for the good, Lord God, for your people and to your glory. We thank you and praise you for that. Though everything, so many things look like it's out of control, Father God, you're sovereign in it. And even the evil intentions, what people might intend for evil, you intend for good. You will make it ultimately bend to your will. You will make all things ultimately serve you to your glory and to our good. Thank you for that. And I pray, Father, if there's anyone in here who doesn't know Christ, that, we'd, that you would open their hearts and minds and they'd look to Christ and be saved. And if I can be a part of sharing more scripture with them and they have questions and I can help answer them, I pray you'd help me to do that. And I just pray you bless everybody and encourage all of your people today here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, with that let's uh, stand and sing and, and be dismissed.